together this morning and, and worship and sing in praises to our Lord and Savior. If you're here this morning as our guest, we certainly want to say a special welcome to you. We're so glad that you've chosen to be with us today and would like to ask if you would, there is a guest card there in the pew in front of you. If you would just take that, give us your contact information, or you can actually do it by your phone. Just scan the little QR code here in the church program if you received one when you came in, and you can do that online. We certainly want to know of your presence with us today, and that gives me an opportunity just to send you some correspondence this week about our church, and again, just letting you know how glad we are you chose to be with us and to worship with us today. We are this morning looking forward to worship. And uh, I know God's Spirit just fill our hearts and fill this place with His presence as we turn our focus and all of our attention to Him this morning. And so as we do that today, as we begin our time of worship, would you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, it's so good to be in your house this morning. And Father, many times we come with very little expectation. But Lord, I pray this morning that as we begin our time together of Lifting up your holy name, your precious name, Father, that today we would be expecting, Father, for you to do great things among us. Lord, we expect to feel the presence of your spirit moving in our hearts, speaking to us, Father, through the songs that we sing, through the message that we hear, Lord. And Father, just knowing that we are in your presence, Father, and your presence is with us. So Father, hear our worship today. Hear our offerings of praise, and may they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
when your face is before me, I can only imagine, I can only imagine. Father, that 
They too will be with you, Father, when their time on this earth is over. And they'll be able to stand before you. And they'll be able to fall to their knees. Father, they'll be able to, to dance before you if they want. But Father, they will be with you. Lord, I just pray that that person, whoever that may be today, will know that before the day out. Lord, I pray that whoever is here today who needs to trust Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Lord, they will make that decision, make that choice today because, Father, you tell us through your word that you are the only way to the Father. No one comes to the Father but through you. Lord, that means that apart from Jesus Christ, our eternity just simply means complete, total separation from you forever and ever. And Father, that is torment. Father, that is going to be just a horrible existence and experience unlike anything we could ever imagine again. So Lord, I pray for that person today who needs to come to you. Who needs to surrender their heart and their life and say, I want to trust Jesus with my life. I want Him as my Savior. I want Him to forgive me of my sin. And I want everlasting life. So Lord, in these next few moments, as we hear from Your Word, Father, will You speak to us? Speak to the hearts that need to be comforted today. Speak to the hearts who may be grieving today. Speak to the hearts who may be struggling today. Father, speak to the hearts who need to hear from you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Be in the book of Philippians, the first chapter, if you have God's Word with you this morning. I certainly invite you to turn there. And as you're turning, uh, I've thought about, of course, this last year and a half, and one of the topics that's been very common is the topic of fear. Certainly we've all experienced great uncertainty, and uh, of course, to some extent, we're still experiencing that with the pandemic. But, um, you know, all with that... You know, it's not just necessarily fear over getting the virus, but it's more fear over what the virus is going to do to us, the effect it's going to have on us, and even the fear of possibly dying from the virus itself. Of course, there's been a very popular phrase or statement, if you will, that I know you've all seen all over, and people setting up crosses in their yard, and this phrase usually sometimes with the cross, and you know what that is, faith without fear. And so as we think about that this morning, I, I don't, you know, everybody has fears. We all have fears. Some people are afraid of snakes. Some are afraid of spiders. Some are afraid of heights. Uh, I, I've noticed as I've gotten older, for some reason, uh, I, I don't like to be way up high like I used to be. Yeah, I've gotten a little bit afraid of heights in my old age and stuff like that. But everybody has fears. We know that. But do you know what the second highest fear is among people. The second highest fear that people have is the fear of death. And of course, when people are afraid of something, what are we going to do? We're going to avoid that at all costs. But here's the problem. If you're afraid of death, you can't avoid death. <laughs> We're all only given a certain amount of time on this earth in this life. All of us will die someday. I was thinking back to the conversation that I had with my mother in her last few months and last few days here in this life. And uh, she knew she was terminal. She had a terminal disease. She knew that her time on earth was very short. And she could go at any time. And of course, as I was able to spend those last few weeks with her and helping care for her, you know, we got to talking a lot about death, and I would just say, well, Mama, how do, how do you feel just knowing that you're going to die? And her statement to me was, she said, I'm not afraid of dying. She said, I'm not afraid of death. But she said, I'm afraid of how 
I'm going to die. And you know, that's the way it is with a lot of people, some people. They're not necessarily afraid of death, they're just afraid of how they're going to die. Now the Apostle Paul, who wrote this book of Philippians, a letter to the Christian believers in Philippi, Paul writes in here, he was not afraid of death. He didn't see death as something to be feared. As a matter of fact, Paul saw death as something to look forward to. Now some people might think, well that's just sort of kind of bizarre. I'm looking forward to dying. (laughs) But we as believers, as we sang a moment ago, we have that living hope. That as we live throughout this life, as our life is, you know, going on, carrying on on this earth, our hope is it won't end when this life ends. Our living hope is Jesus Christ. And that's the way the Apostle Paul was. Death was a plus for him. Death wasn't just about going to heaven, but for Paul, death was about going to Jesus. You see the difference? If if you go ahead, ladies, and bring up my first slide there. For believers in Christ, no, it should say point one. Do you see that? For believers in Christ, death is not about an end to an existence, but death is about an eternal existence. It's about resurrection. And Paul not only saw death being about resurrection, but Paul also saw death as being about a relationship. And as we've been concentrating this year on discipleship and being disciples of Christ and being more Christ-like, that's an aspect of discipleship that I think is, is many times forgotten. That aspect of relationship. A lot of times we think about discipleship as learning, as studying, as, as trying to grow in order to become like something or like someone. But first and foremost, discipleship is all about relationship. I don't know how many of you are aware, but we have some of the young couples in our church who who started a small group back at the beginning of the year and they meet every Monday evening. And they join together and they have a meal together and then they spend time. Guys go off to their own little space, ladies go to their space, and they spend time together studying God's Word and discussing God's Word. In their little group. That's discipleship. But it's about building a relationship with one another. It's about making that connection with brothers and sisters in Christ. And learning together. And encouraging one another. And lifting one another up. And fellowshipping with one another. That's all a part about discipleship. It's all about relationship. And that even includes death. And that's what I want us to talk about this morning. And think about how can death have to do with relationship? Look at Paul's words here in this first chapter of Philippians, beginning in verse 20. He said, It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, then that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. So why is it that there are so many people... That fear death. Well, I've got just very one simple answer. It's just simply uncertainty. As I spoke about about my mother, it could be just uncertainty of the pain that you might experience as you're dying. It could be the uncertainty of what awaits on the other side. It could be just the uncertainty of what the experience of death is going to be like on and on and on and on. You know, uh, all of us know we just got back from the mountains, a little vacation this week, and as many of y'all are aware, our daughter has three foster children, and of course Rebecca and, and the children were able to come with us and spend the week with us. And of course, the children, they have a five-year-old and then two four-year-olds that are twins. 
And uh, of course, when we would put them to bed at night, what would you have to do? Leave the light on, right? Whether it's closet light or whatever. Uh, Rebecca got this little night light device that not only is a night light, but it plays music. I, I kind of call it a little tinkling music, like twinkle, twinkle, little star or something like that, you know, uh, for them to calm them and soothe them, you know, as they go to sleep. But it's got that light. Because, and, I, and I'm sure many of you parents were aware, we all went through it, children seem to be afraid of the dark, most of them anyway. And why is that? It's because they can't see. If something bad is about to happen or if something's about to reach out and grab them, they at least want a little bit of warning to be able to see, but they don't have that. And so that's why they're afraid of the dark. Well, you know, in a lot of ways, it's kind of the same for us when it comes to death. It's just simply people are fearful because of the uncertainty. We don't really know. I mean, as believers, we know, okay, we're going to be in heaven, we're going to be with Jesus. But we don't know a whole lot of details about death and what the death experience is actually going to be like. Job, he even questioned the experience of death himself. In Job 14.10, he says, But a man dies and is laid low. Man breathes his last, and where is he? But now for some people, they don't really think much about death. They may not have such a great fear of death. They believe in in some kind of existence or some kind of life after death. And and if that's the case, then they, they need to have a very strong case. They need to have very strong proof of some type of existence in the afterlife. Several weeks back, we, we talked about God has chosen us and God pursuing after us. If you remember, uh, the points I made, God knows us, God chose us, and, and God holds us. And we talked about how God has set this curiosity about eternity in our hearts. It, it even talks about that in Scripture. God has set eternity in the hearts of people. And so why is that? Because God, as we've said, He wants a personal relationship with us. And that relationship is not just for this life, it carries over into the next life. God wants us to be eager. He wants us to be enthusiastic for that next life, not anxious about it. So, the reason why many people are fearful of death is because they don't really have... Or don't really understand or see or know that solid evidence of life beyond the grave. Or whatever it is they do believe might be very shaky. Here's my next point. And this should be point two on the slide there. The good news is this. For those here today, God has given man the greatest piece of evidence to prove that death isn't something that needs to be feared. And that evidence is just simply this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let's look at that evidence for a moment. You know, y'all have heard as well as I have, and I'm very skeptical about these claims. Many people who have claimed to die and then come back from the dead You know, there's been many books written about it, people having that experience and how they they see this great light and they just feel drawn to this light and all that kind of stuff. And for the majority of those people, their death or near death experience has been maybe just a matter of minutes. I even heard on the news this past week a pastor, now he said he didn't actually die, but he said the Lord gave him this vision, and it was so real, this vision of being in hell, and how it was so real to him and so frightening to him. Now, honestly, when I heard of his account, when he sort of kind of told what he saw, what he experienced, my thought is, well, he's not telling me anything that Scripture hasn't already told me about hell anyway. So did he really have the vision, or is he really just claiming to have this vision? It's the same thing with those people who have claimed to have died, gone to heaven or gone somewhere, and then come back to life. But the one thing 
that distinguishes Christ's return from the dead from all the other claims that have been made is the actual evidence. Hundreds of witnesses who saw the physically resurrected Jesus. And even adding to that beforehand, people who actually saw Jesus die on the cross, stop breathing, saw his body laid in a tomb, buried, and the stone rolled in front of it, sealed so that nobody would be able to open it. Hundreds of people. And Paul, in the book of 1 Corinthians, he speaks about this. About this evidence. And he writes this to, of course, the believers in Corinth, which, of course, is the book of Corinthians in our New Testament there. And this was a public letter that was supposed to be distributed. All of Paul's letters that he wrote. He wrote to specific churches, specific Christians. But the majority of them were to be distributed among all the other early Christian churches and the early Christians there in, in Asia and around that area, around that region that, that Paul continually checked on, that Paul oversaw. And this was one of them. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 5, listen to what he says about Jesus and his appearance after his resurrection. He says, he appeared to Cephas. Then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom who are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and even to all the apostles. And then Paul says, last of all, as the one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Here's two things about that. Which I believe just that verse alone, those few verses alone, gives rock solid evidence of Jesus' resurrection. And again, going back to the relationship that is even part of death, our relationship with God, our relationship with Christ. And here's the next slide. If y'all want to go ahead and bring that up. Here's the first reason. Why is this rock solid evidence? Because just simply the appearance of Jesus to more than 500 men, it says. Now sometimes in Scripture... When it uses that term man or men, a lot of times it's speaking, you know, in general terms. It's including all people, women as well. But in this particular instance, it's just talking about men. Sorry, women, you weren't included in this count here when Jesus rose again. So women were in addition to these 500 men. And then what it says also, not only did he appear to these 500 men, but he appeared to them all at one time. Not just to a couple here and a few there and a couple there. No, 500 men plus the women all at once, all at one time. You see, if Jesus had just appeared to a person or two or three or whatever after his death, then the claims of his resurrection would really be no different than the claims of seeing Bigfoot or seeing the Loch Ness Monster. And then Paul goes on to say, not only did it appear to all these men, but he says, some of these men are still alive, even at the time Paul is writing this letter to the Corinthians. So therefore, there was ample opportunity for this claim that Paul was making about Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, appearing to all these people. There was ample opportunity for that evidence to be disputed. But it wasn't. No one could deny what Paul was saying that truly happened. In Acts chapter 1 verse 3, Luke even writes this. He says, he, Jesus, presented himself alive to them, his disciples, after his suffering by many proofs. And appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So Luke even claims here, Jesus not only appeared to his disciples and gave them many proofs. And you remember the one instance of Thomas? When Jesus showed up, Thomas had that doubt. He said, I won't believe Jesus is risen until I can see the nail prints in his hand and the spear wound in his side. And Jesus shows up and you know what happened? He said, Thomas, look at here. See the nail print in my hand. Look at my side. See the wound in my side. That's just only one example of proof to his disciples. 
But not only that, he said he appeared to them for 40 days. Jesus didn't just show up for a few moments and then vanish, never to be seen again. No, he spent time with his disciples over a month conversing, eating with, talking with, fellowshipping with his disciples after he had risen from the dead. Now, there have been all kinds of attempts made throughout history to prove that Jesus is still dead. But they haven't been able to prove it. If anything, they've proven just the opposite. That Jesus rose from the dead and Jesus is still alive today. Second reason why I believe this passage in 1 Corinthians is rock solid evidence is the relational purpose. If you remember last week, we talked about the whole purpose for our existence in this life is to have a relationship with God, our Creator. But that relationship was broken because of sin. But when Christ died on the cross, He provided the way for our relationship with God to be restored, to be reconciled by believing in Him. And when Christ, after He appeared to all these people on this earth, after His resurrection, where did He go? He ascended back to heaven to be with His Father, to sit at the right hand of His Father. All about relationship. And Christ's resurrection shows us that our relationship with God does continue even after death if... You are a believer in Jesus Christ and you have trusted Him as your Lord and as your Savior. I mean, if God so desired a relationship with us, why would He have that relationship end at the point of our death, our physical death here on this earth? I mean, that would be totally out of God's character. And God's ultimate move was sending His Spirit, as far as relationships, sending His Spirit when Jesus ascended back to heaven. The Holy Spirit came upon the people. Sent His Spirit into this world to live in the hearts of those who who would trust and believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I'm going to kind of expound on that next week. But again, relationship. And certainly there's no escaping the reality that each and every day that we spend in this life, we're moving closer and closer to an afterlife. But the resurrection of Jesus, it shatters every anxiety or every fear that we should have about dying. You know, I said at the beginning that death is one of the greatest fears that people have. But Paul said he looked forward to death and that next life. Again, not just because he he was going to be in heaven and not hell, but because of continuing in his relationship with Christ in heaven that had only began here on this earth. To Paul, this wasn't a theory. It wasn't even just mere hope. It wasn't a religion. To Paul, this was reality. I mean, do you hear any fear in Paul's words in the passage we read this morning, verse 23, where he says, My desire is to depart, to be with Christ, for that is far better. Doesn't sound like one who's afraid of dying to me or fearful of dying to me in those words. Or in Paul's words in verse 21, For to me, to live is Christ, but yet to die... Is to gain. To gain even more of Christ. You know, every day, as disciples and as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to live out those words that I mentioned at the beginning. Faith without fear. Not just during a time of pandemic or during a time of uncertainty. It needs to be... Our life's theme, it needs to be seen in our life, no matter what we face, that our faith far outweighs any fears or any anxieties we might have, including any fear of death. 
And there is no reason to fear death. Because we have hope. We have that evidence that we spoke about this morning. In Christ's resurrection and the reality of that relationship that God desires to have with us. Why else would God have planted those thoughts and that curiosity of eternity in our hearts? Would you pray with me? Father... We've come this morning expressing our love for you through worship. Father, we come this morning lifting up your name, praising your name, Father, because of the relationship as followers and believers of Jesus Christ that we are in with you. Lord, this morning again, If there's one here in this place and and they're not certain about where their eternity will be spent, Lord, give them boldness, give them courage to come during this time of decision, this time of invitation, and let's get that straight in their minds before they leave this place today. Lord, we know that you told us that Jesus is the only way to you. Through believing and trusting in Him, His death and His resurrection. And receiving Him as Lord and Savior. If there is one here today who needs to make that choice, that decision. Again, Father, I pray in all boldness and courage, they would just step out during this time. Saying, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm far from God. I know I don't have a relationship with God, so I want to trust Jesus. I want that relationship to be restored, and I want that relationship to continue on in eternity, even after my life on this earth is over. So, Father, I just pray that your spirit just move among us, and I thank you in advance for what you will do. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. We're just going to stand together. Our hymn of decision is just as I am. Without one plea. Lord, I come. Lord, I come. So as we sing, if God's spoken to you, will you come to him today and respond? Let's sing that together.